you want this pulpit down there? Oh, that's good. And you have a stool to sit on? I have a stool. That's good. You get home? <laughs> anyway, we're happy to have you, Frank. God bless you. You minister here in the church to our youth and, and minister to us. The Lord bless you really good. Frank? Friero. I missed one syllable. I'm sorry. Where's your pulpit? I'm going to take my pulpit. So, uh, well, I just call this a music stand because that's the pulpit. And now if I say something wrong, I can't, you know, I didn't say it from the pulpit, right? <laughs> I was actually thinking of that joke for the last 10 minutes, so. <laughs> it doesn't make me, doesn't make me anything. I'm not a very shrewd young man, just a very wise one. So, um, lately, every time I've had the opportunity, because I really enjoy having this opportunity uh, to speak to you guys in front of the Word, uh, the Lord put in my heart that He wanted me to start on Paul, and then when the Lord tells me to stop, I'll stop, and maybe I'll go to Jesus. But, you know, everything that Paul, Paul talks about reflects on what Jesus did anyway. So, we'll get a little bit more of a a little bit more of a, a broader thing. We're going to understand what the New Testament says, what, the, what Paul says. So I've been bouncing around. I've been really letting the Lord direct me in different areas. So this past week, uh, I had the opportunity to get my hair cut. And that is just a, an amazing thing. I love getting my hair cut. And, uh, and, and I've just been blessed uh, because I love going. I think, it's, I think getting your hair cut is one of the greatest ministry opportunities you have. How many times do you have... 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on how slow or fast your, your uh, beautician is, uh, you have to sit down with somebody who 95% of the time doesn't know the Lord. And what are they going to, and, and, and they're always trained to talk to you about what do you do. So the question always comes up when I go to the, to get my hair cut, uh, the question always comes up, what do you do? And in my heart, I'm like, oh man, do I want to tell them? Am I scared? And should I just tell them, you know, you know, I'm just a student or something like that? Uh, I, I do, I do work with youth, uh, you know, kind of, I can dance my way around it. But I, I've made a personal decision in my life that when somebody asks me that question, even though every time somebody asks me that question, I'm going to 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 hesitate and, 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 and want to not say it because I'm afraid of being judged because I'm a pastor. I said, I'm a youth pastor. And that immediately opens up opportunity to talk about the Lord. So you know, I have 10 minutes, and it's always the first question in the day. What do you do? I'm a youth pastor. Oh, that's great. What church do you go to? And I say, First Assembly of God, the church right, you know, county quarter to uh, Taco Tree over here on 49. So, and people are like, yeah, yeah, the small church, or oh, yeah, yeah, the church right there. You know, they always know, yeah, the church that does the garage sale. Uh, or I used to go to that church. I've had that a couple of times. Uh, you know, you know, and I'm like, oh, that's great. But this time, I had an opportunity to talk to talk to this young lady just graduated from Plaster High School in 2010. So not this past May, but the year before. And she went and got her uh, cosmetology. Went to cosmetology school and got her license to do cosmetology. And now she was cutting my hair. And I was like, oh, I have a girl that's could be, you know, just out of my ears, cutting my hair. Uh, this is great, but she did an amazing job. I actually think this is the best job anybody's done uh, on my hair in a long time. Uh, and then she put some gel on it, and I was like, oh, this is so awesome, I love it. I'm never going to be able to do it again uh, this way. So I tried, and I still can't get the same format and every hair in place that she did, but, you know, I'm getting there. Uh, but I had the opportunity to talk to her, and she was talking, and we were... She was. She was talking about. Uh, uh, she started talking about uh, uh, karma, and and I was just like, well, I'm I'm a firm believer that you uh, that you you do what goes around kind of comes around. That's what you reap what you sow, and what you put out there will eventually come back to you. Uh, and karma has those kind of aspects to it. And she kept saying, oh, so you believe in karma? I was like, well, you can say that, but you not necessarily everything that actually karma does believe in. I mean. I like to say that all the, the truth out there is God's truth. 
but there's a lot of things that other religions don't teach that the Bible does that is it so karma has aspects that there's good things you can take out of it but I wouldn't say I believe in karma I said I more like to say that I believe in you reap what you sow and, and that's more of a biblical terminology that I like to use and I told her um, I told her well you know what what people put out put out into the world uh, they're gonna get back it, it goes around comes around and it, it's happened and, and, and that happens positively positively and negative. I know that that verse gets a lot of negative connotations to it, as in they always say, uh, you reap you re what you sow, like you're going to get back what you get, what's coming to you, or it's going to it's gonna get it. And, and, and there's there's aspects to that, but it's also a good thing, because when you sow into to the fields of the harvest, to the harvest fields that the Lord has asked us to, he's, we're going to get pod, we're going to get back from that too. When we, we, we tie, when we, off, we do offer, we get back to it. Now that's not necessarily exactly what my sermon is about. But it's about, it's about sowing the seed, sowing good seed, sowing bad seed. So let's, let's take a look at what Paul says here in Galatians 6 and uh, 7 through 10. And then I want to dive in. I, I know a lot of you guys have gotten to know me, but one thing I haven't shared, and there was actually, I asked a friend who actually came to Washington one time to speak on Sunday night. He says, well, I thought you were going to share your testimony. Uh, and my testimony is powerful, and I finally found a place where I can actually share most of my testimony. And we're going to start talking about that a little bit, too. So Galatians 6, 7 through 10. It says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good for the proper, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not, if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I want to start, I want to start off here, and, and this is kind of what I like to share. Uh, there's, I was taught in school, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys some tips. Where you sit and how your posture is when you speak to people communicates something. So if I'm standing and telling you my testimony, I don't think it's going to be as impactful as me sitting down and telling you my testimony because it's a more of a personal thing. And I feel like you guys are getting it, we'll get it, understand it a little better, and feel a little bit more. And maybe you guys won't be looking at my hands and arms going all over the place and me walking up and down the aisles because that's all I do. Because it's not because I'm nervous; it's because this is why I preach. This is the way I worship. This is the way I do everything. I love doing this. And the seat keeps me confined. Even the youth come sometimes yell at me because we're that little room there and I'm running around in circles. So I'm, I'm going to start by telling you, talking about one of the worst days of my life. Um, that day happens to fall on Halloween, 2001. October 31st, 2001. I went to school that morning and I was excited for one reason because. I loved Halloween, and I knew I was going to get some free candy later on that night. I was a junior in high school, and I was, I was super excited about going out to retreat. I was dating a really beautiful girl. Uh, her name was Robin, and, you know, I just, you know, I thought I was in love with her uh, at the age of 17, if I knew what love was, and if I even still know what love is. Uh, but I was dating this girl, and we've been dating for a few weeks now, and she comes to tell me that she did not want to continue on our relationship. Uh, it hurt. It was a hurtful day. It was hard. I really hated this day already. Um, and you know what? It was hard because I had really strong feelings for her, and probably one of the girls I actually loved, liked for her, not necessarily what she was on the outside. She was beautiful, but she was even more beautiful on the inside, which made her more beautiful on the outside. Um, so, I was devastated. And I was going home. And you're talking about a couple weeks, a couple weeks after, uh, you know, 9-11, you know, the, the, the aura of the East Coast, and anybody who lived in the East Coast around the time of line, 9-11, wasn't good. You go home, you, have, you still see clips of 9-11, on the video thing, we were, we're about to start a war on terrorism. I think by that time we already uh, started sending our troops over to the Middle East. And 
uh, and it's just, it's not a positive time. Uh, it's, it's also not the greatest time in my house either. Uh, my parents were, my mom was uh, for majority of her life an alcoholic, very abusive, even verbally, not physically. Uh, and my dad didn't really care, so he was mentally abusive to me and my brother. And uh, we wanted to do, I wanted to play sports. I was always passionate for sports. And my parents didn't really, my mom cared and she loved us, uh, probably a little bit too much, uh, you know, but my dad didn't care. He was like, work comes first. I have to work 86 hours a week and you guys, I need to put food on the table. And that was why he, he thought that it was, it was, it was important for him to, to, to work so he could feed us. And that was his, his driving thing. But we wanted his love. We wanted to spend time with him. And that was something that we didn't get a lot of when we were growing up. My mom, then we would get left home, at, uh, left home alone with my mom, who is herself not getting any love from her husband and seeking, uh, you know, seeking to get some sort of attention from her, her kids. So she finds, and she's a very hurt past too, and she is a, an amazing testimony uh, too. So seeking to find something to fill her hole in, she finds it in alcohol. Uh, so she drinks, and she drinks, and she drinks, and she comes very, very, very angry drunk and she yells things that she doesn't mean but she yells it out and we're really taking the book. Me and my brother take the book for all the pain that my dad has administered to my mom emotionally, all the pain that her family has administered to her. And she was the youngest of five and she really she really didn't have a good life and we were kind of receiving some of the pain that was coming out. And she was hurt and she was hurting people. Hurt people hurt people. Um, it hurt. It was sad. There was days where I got physically angry and I physically uh, hit people, and I, you know, and I've had and I had police call to my house, and they, they, they talked to me. They were like, "Oh, you're by the age of 18, you're going to end up in prison. You're just going to be a, a, another kid. Uh, I'm not going to. It's not going to be too long before we see you again." Then my mom got saved. Um, my dad left October 31st, 2001. Destroyed my heart. Because now whatever I had left of a father was gone. And still, he wasn't in a home. Lack of discipline. My mom got saved a few months later in January, March. Between January and March of that year, started going to the first summit of God in Greentown, Pennsylvania. And my mom got saved. She started living for the Lord. She's reading the Bible and speaking in tongues. And I'm, what? You're crazy? Blah, blah, blah. We're Catholic. We need a, we need a Catholic church. Uh, you know. And uh, that was great. My mom was trying to tell me to go to church. She's trying to be nice. But now, now the tables have kind of turned. Mom gave up alcohol, she wasn't drinking, full turkey, the Lord. Stopped smoking, full turkey. Anybody who's ever had problems with either smoking or alcohol knows that it's incredibly difficult for a person to stop cold turkey. My mom does both of them by the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. Cold turkey. I see that, but I try to throw it out and pitch it out. She's going to go back. Don't worry. She goes through these things. And there were some times where she struggled. She went back to alcohol. Uh, it was a little bit of time, a few years later. Um, but that, at that time, I already committed my life to the Lord. Uh, so me and my brother growing up, uh, and my, my mom's going to church all the time. And I'm like, you know, all right, perfect. My mom wants us to go to church. So what, do I, what can I get from her? So my mom was making a little bit of money because she was taking care of my grandfather. And I was like, all right, mom, I want a big screen TV. So she got me a $2,000 TV. Mom, I want a car. She got me a $5,000, like, three-year-old car at the time. Um, I got whatever I want. I took advantage of the, the kindness that my mom had in her heart. And she was really doing it out of genuine. She wanted me to come to church. She wanted me to see the love of Jesus Christ. And I took advantage of that. Um, and then it got worse. The time was... Uh, I became a senior, got my license, got my uh, car, got involved with girls, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I got involved with girls. 
I got involved with friends who uh, I got involved with friends who were doing things that were against the law, and part of it was smoking marijuana, drinking. The thing that I loathe the most, drinking. I loathe drinking the most. Funny that I ended up with the assembly that I got. Uh, I loathe drinking the most, and I started doing it. And I wasn't. I would never say that I was an addicted to any of these substances, but the road that I saw myself going down was not a good road. My friend, a few years after I got saved, my friend, I went to him and I was speaking, speaking to him, and the kid was just out, out of it. I was talking to him on the phone. He's out of it, losing brain cells from doing cocaine, and that was the road that was out, because he was my, one of my best friends. He was my right-hand man. He was my right-hand man, and I would have gone down that road had not God intervened. I was making poor choices in my life. I graduated from college. I continued to make poor choices in my life. I had warrants, at, <laughs> warrants out for my arrest for tickets that I hadn't paid. And I, I didn't know what was happening in my life. My whole goal was I wanted to go to college. I wanted to succeed. I wanted to do something successful. I wanted to be successful by world standards. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to have Lamborghinis. I wanted to have Armani suits. I wanted to dress real nice. I wanted to have a nice hairdo. Uh, you know, stuff that's all good. But I was getting in a little bit of trouble. I was going into... To, it wasn't a lot, but I was gone into debt. Uh, I didn't have a job, and I was living off my mom. I was living off people, and then I got a job. But I had to move. And this is like the Don Divinely, like in, December, in November of 2003, I had to move to live with some family in New Jersey. And I worked, and I just worked. That's what I did, I just worked. Uh, made money, paid off my debts, and we anything big, paid off my debts. Um, and then by January, well, by December, I got the news that, the uh, news that would change my life. On December 18th, 2003, um, a good friend uh, died in a car accident. She was in my classes from seventh grade to graduation. I knew her for almost a decade. And at that time of your life, that's like the majority of your life. You're like 17, it's like 10 years is like forever. Um, she died in a car accident. And the first, when I found out about it, I first was like, this person who has had a great influence on my life, who's been part of my life, majority of my life, who at, at the time we almost dated, uh, ended up ended up dying. I'll never see her again. And I said, what if I walked out the door today? What if I walked out this door today and I slipped and fell on this ice? Because there's like ice everywhere in the Northeast. Uh, especially in December. And I whacked my head so hard and I was gone. And I had to stand before because I did believe there was a God. But I didn't really care about serving him. Um, I stand before God, and I have to hold account for everybody I've hurt, everybody that I've, every sin that I've committed, and where would I go? It wasn't some question that some pastor or a preacher asked me. I was sitting in a room contemplating death, contemplating, you know, what happens after you die, leading me in the positive direction, leading me home specifically to go back to school, and I, don't, I haven't given my life to the, to the Lord. And it comes around that there's this close neighbor that has uh, been friends with my mom. Mom's going to church. She's going to all these different retreats. And there's this retreat called an encounter retreat that they want me to go to. And I say, I'm going to go. Uh, and they do some post-retreat things. There's stuff that I don't want to give up. I'm listening to, like, heavy metal music and, you know, uh, you know stuff that is just crazy, you know, bad word, every other two words, and 
And I was like, I'm not giving that up. It's, it's not bad. So it's, it doesn't really motivate me. But it did. It influenced my life. Music influenced me at that time. Well, music really influences a lot of people. Music, you know, influenced me. I went to this retreat. And at this retreat, I found out that God is the only thing I need in my life. That all the drugs, all the girls, all the love that I look for in areas of my life, I didn't need to look for that because I only had one person that I needed to find it in. And I did it in that. So you're asking, why does he, you know, we're talking about reaping what you sell, but why, why is Pastor Frank talking about his testimony? This is not a salvation message. This isn't something that you do. Well, here's why. The people, there's people influential in my life who, who sowed seed, who kept doing it. My church prayed for two years, two years. Every prayer meeting, you know what, what was one of the top things? Frank and Eric was my brother to, to come to the Lord. For two years, my church prayed. And one day I walked in the door. I left the door with this. I was like, man, that was crazy. You know, the Spirit just touched me. And then two weeks later, I come and I give my testimony on a Sunday night service that I just this morning committed my life to the Lord at a retreat. The answer to prayer. You reap what you sow. When I came to the Lord, I was so on fire for God, and I got involved in the youth group. I got involved in the youth group, and the group grew from two, three, eight, I think they had eight on average, uh, on a good day, to averaging between 25 and 30 students. And that's half of what we were attending, our attendance were on Sunday mornings. On top of it, I had several of my friends who I was, I was associated with prior to my salvation starting to come to school, uh, starting to come to church. So you have all these drug addicts, doped out kids who don't know, care about anything else but themselves. And then they have this kid who's just been radically saved and he's telling them we need to go to church. And they're all coming to church. And they're all hearing the word. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I found out that one of, uh, one of my friends who I wanted to come to church, who didn't come to church, but I asked to come to church, that's it. You reap what you sow. And the first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about good seed. Or I want to talk about bad seed. There's some bad seed that was sown in my life that I still had to work through after I got saved. It wasn't, oh, now I'm saved and I'm all holy and, and I'm going to heaven and I'm, I'm perfect. No, I was far from perfect and I'm still working out that. And there's things I just had to work on. I needed to find a mentor in my life. I found that in Pastor Wayne Mitchell, who ended up being my spiritual father, and who's still today, this is going to fall, um, is, is a mentor in my life, and who I call for counsel. He's great. Then we have Pastor Baker, and then we have Pastor Cummings and Pastor Colbert here um, for, for mentor. And I, I love talking with them about just things, you know, the Lord, and I, I'm praying for some more opportunities to talk to you about ministry and, and about just life as a Christian because they have a lot of experience. And there's other people in this church who have experience in, in, in the faith and in the Lord, and, and it's just great. You know, I've only been saved seven years, March 5th, 2004, seven and a half years almost. And, and by the way, I started Bible school six months after my salvation, and I was around. That changed me. I like, grew like 10 years in my first year. Um, but to read it, which is, there's some people that were sowed by some bad seed. And my dad sowed some bad seed into my life. And my mom was hurt by a lot of the seed that my dad sowed into our lives, into her lives. And my mom was so bitter. And still at times she gets bitter about my father not being there. And, you know, the bitterness, you know, was started. And, and the Lord really came to me and he said to me, when I got saved, you need to forgive your father because because 
You know, the, if you allow this damaged relationship to continue with your father, then it will damage the relationship, you have, the new relationship you've had with your heavenly father. You need to forgive your father. I forgive my father. Two weeks ago, on my birth, three weeks ago, my birthday, July 9th, my father called me. Uh, and he said to me, he said, this kid had just, you know, everything, everything positive happened. I know this isn't a really happy, no lucky story. But this kid had just gotten into an accident. He was on a skateboard and he, he was pushed by a car and it whacked back in his head. He went into a, a coma and actually they were pronounced him dead on arrival, but they put him on machines uh, because the parents weren't there and they needed the parents' permission to, to terminate life. Uh, this was in New York. My dad went up there and my dad was so moved by this, moved by the Christians, the kids, hundreds of kids who this kid had impacted. Uh, come to pray for him from various different denominations, from various different religions. They had Muslims reading the word of God because of this kid and praying that something would happen. My dad was there and he was so moved by the radical movement of youth that he, he called me and he was like, I never want to put you or my, my brother, Eric, in the head of God. I think I've done that in my life sometimes. And I was like, I don't think so. Uh, but, you know, I was just more impactful that God was moving in my dad's life. And I was, I was so excited afterwards. And, and there's some things that my dad, you know, my dad's, I don't think my dad's saved yet. Because he's, he's talking about the Lord and every other word is like a cuss word. And I'm like, ah. But God's moving. God's moving in his life. God's going to do something great in his life. God told my mom before I got saved that my dad would come back. My mom's lost faith in that. It's been 10 years now. It'll be 10 years on October 31st. My mom's lost faith in that. I haven't. Statistics say that the further the separation goes, the longer the time the separation, the less time to, that they would get back. My parents have never officially filed for divorce. They're still separated after 10 years. I believe that one day, my dad will come back to my mom. I believe that. There were some seeds laid in my life that hurt. I let it go, and I realized that I had to sow something good. There was only the bad seed only sold selfishness. It sold destruction. That's all the bad seed was doing in my life. It was all that my bad seed was doing in my mom's life. And I wanted to start doing something good. So I looked, I looked to some good seed. I wanted to sow some good seed. So as soon as I started, and I didn't even know I was sowing good seed. So don't, don't be like, oh, Frank was trying to sow. I didn't know. I didn't know the word of God when I first got saved. I just knew I loved God. And I knew that I started, needed to start reading his word because this is going to make me more love God. And I more love God now that I'm really, I know a lot about his word and I know a lot of theological things. And I still love God and I'm so passionate for God. And you know what I love most about God is I love to worship God. The question was asked to me several times, so why do I move around a lot? I love moving around because when I first got saved, I, was, I sat right here in my church. And I had a, a gentleman who sat right where Pastor Colbert's sitting. He came up to me. I was so motivated by you, a young man at that time, 19 years old, coming to the Lord and just dancing in the spirit. He called it dancing. I was a little bit more enthusiastic in my movement around Pastor Colbert. Uh, so I, he called it, he called it monkey dancing. That's what he called it. <laughs> I was like, oh, this part makes sense. I kind of look like a monkey, so. Uh, so I wanted to sow good seeds. So the first thing I started doing is I started preaching Preaching God's word and uh, probably pre preach some heresies. So I'm, I'm glad Paul wasn't there to kill me or something. Um, so, but my youth pastors and pastors that trained me through this and got me through this, I started reaping and seeing people started coming to the Lord. People started coming to church, not necessarily coming to the Lord. 
And then I left for school, and, and some bad things happened in the church, and, um, and that was great. And I found a new home church, and it, and it was actually my spiritual father, Pastor Wayne Mitchell, who I was actually now serving as a youth director at their staff. And I reaped some good sow seed there. But you know what? I never saw, I never saw this come to life. I never saw, I, saw, I, I had two kids for almost a year and a half not grow at all. But these kids were the most on fire kids that, that there can be. I was preaching the word of God. I was, I had people upstairs coming, telling me that they were, you know, they didn't know which service to go to. You know, the youth service or the, or the young adult. And that's nothing to me because God was moving in my life. It's not something that I did, right? It's what I was following with the Lord. I was sowing some good seed into to, to my life. I'm never going to, you know, I see that seed now on Facebook. Thank God for Facebook because now I can look and, and, and call. I can email and, and do a bunch of stuff. Hey, they're posting scriptures. They're posting this. I have a girl who, I, who was part of my ministry in New York, not my ministry, but the Lord's ministry that he allowed me to lead in New York, uh, who is now at Valley Forge Christian College, my alma mater, and she is on one of the two, like I said, there's a thousand students and they pick between 10 and 20 students to serve on the ministry teams. She's playing bass on their traveling ministry teams. And she works for the admissions department for Valley Forge Christian College. I feel like I, I, I'm starting to see some of the, the seed that is sown. Paul says, Paul says this, he says, I sowed some seed, Apollos came and he harvested, but God is the one that did the water. I'm sowing some seed, and I'm sowing some seed, and you know, at times the seed's not going to grow in the right places, and sometimes it's going to grow with weeds. And Jesus tells us in Matthew, he says that we're going to have to let the, the, the good seed the good plant grow with the weeds because if we take out the weeds, we're going to rip out the good roots. And then we could cut off the, when they're fully grown, we'll cut it out. And I always wondered about that scripture. But what does sowing good seed produce? This is my last point. What does sowing good seed produce? And I was like, I was thinking about this when I was thinking about preaching I was like, Man, this is going to be a hard point to come. I had the first good seed, good seed and bad seed, but I have to have a third point or else I'm going to go crazy. And I said, I said to myself, what does it produce? We'll find out what it produces. In Galatians 5, 23 through 24. And we can turn to that. I'll read that to you. It's actually 23. 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified their sinful nature with their passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep this in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. Wow. We'll just get that word. Provoking and inviting, whatever. You guys, if you have a Bible, you can read that. Sorry. For some reason, I just can't read it anymore. Uh, what the so good seed produce? In two ways it produces. When you sow good seed, you produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Because you're doing the things of the Spirit. You sow good seed, you produce the fruit of the Spirit in others' lives. The fruit of the Spirit will come from bad seed because sin and the darkness and light can't exist together, as Pastor talked about this morning. Darkness and life can't explicit, uh, live together. Neither can good seed or bad seed. Because the bad will be destroyed and the good will produce the fruit. So, we have joy, peace, forbear forbearance, some, some, some transitions. Well, let's just read this one. We have joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. What is, what are the fruit, what is the fruit that 
this in our lives. That is my question to you guys today. What fruit are we producing in our lives? Maybe it's fruit that you haven't yet seen. Maybe it's fruit that you haven't, you'll never see. Maybe it's fruit that you see right now. I'll tell you this. Some of this fruit is fruit that you should be seeing right now. Because if you're not joyful, if you don't have no self-control, if you don't have peace, if you don't have gentleness, if you don't have faithfulness, kindness, I'm going to say this. I don't think you have Christ. I'm going to. I'm going to ask Pastor Colbert to come back up.